It is now my delight to introduce our featured guest this evening, Ambassador Susan Rice. Ambassador Rice served as the 27th U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations from 2009 to 2013. And she served as U.S. National Security Advisor from 2013 to 2017. In her role as National Security Advisor, Ambassador Rice led the National Security Council staff of approximately 400 defense, diplomatic, intelligence, and development experts. She provided President Obama daily national security briefings. As U.S. Permanent Representative to the United Nations and a member of President Obama's cabinet, Ambassador Rice worked to advance U.S. interests, she worked to defend universal values. She worked to strengthen the world's security and prosperity. And she worked to promote respect for human rights. Ambassador Rice is currently Distinguished Visiting Research Fellow at the School of International Service at American University and a non-resident senior fellow at the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government. She is also a contributing opinion writer for the New York Times. Joining Ambassador Rice on stage is Sally Jewell, Interim Chief Executive Officer of the Nature Conservancy. Previously, Ms. Jewell was U.S. Secretary of the Interior from 2013 to 2017. During her tenure, she was recognized for using a science-based, landscape-level, collaborative approach to natural resources management. And she demonstrated a commitment to connecting people, and particularly young people, to nature. We are truly in for a treat as we listen in on this conversation tonight with two masterminds of public service. Ambassador Rice's book, Tough Love, My Story of the Things Worth Fighting For, is the subject for tonight's talk. So please, Seattle, join me in welcoming to the stage Ambassador Susan Rice with Sally Jewell. in Seattle, we know how to welcome people. Amen. Wow, thank you. She was even offered a glass of wine before coming out here. Yeah, but, you and, know, she's and on e under great duress, I turned it down. But she's only on East until Coast we time. get to the signing line. And yeah, then. and I didn't, I didn't want to be carrying the water here. Susan's here to carry the water. Well, it's a pleasure to be back with you. It's been uh, really probably since that amazing party in the White House when things closed out, where you, you bump into people like, oh, you know, Paul McCartney and uh, Stevie Wonder. And we have to explain what this was. This, this was like the going, the, well, you, t you explain. Well, you know, in the Obama White House, we knew how to party. It's true, and, it's true. <laughs> and it, starting with the president and the first lady. So at least once a year, and maybe a little more frequently, they'd have a serious throwdown with <laughs> all kinds of talent. And the last such party was about two weeks before the end of the administration. And of course, there was nothing to hold back. So, <laughs> it so was, when did you it was leave? quite a party. What time did you leave? I think maybe 3, 3.30, but only because we had our daughter with us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I walked out with the vice president at midnight, so I missed the bacon bar. Um, You're making Biden look bad. Come on. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, you're an amazing person. I first met Susan 
When she was uh, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations, and uh, hardly knew her, but uh, one of the first things she said is, I have a great place to stay in New York, and I'm never there on the weekends, because that's when I go home to my family, so you know, if you want to use it. So that's the kind of colleague that Susan Rice was, and that's my first deep memory. I thought, Ambassador Rice, the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., and she's inviting me to stay in her place in New York City? I thought, wow. What am I doing here? The same feelings I had at that party, uh, by the way. <laughs> so, um, so talk a little bit about your early life. Your father was a Tuskegee Airman, so he's probably on the older side when you were born, I'm guessing. Your yes. mom was an amazing person and one of the main reasons we have the Pell Grants. Tell us about your parents a little bit and maybe like your first experiences with tough love. <sighs> Okay, first of all, before I answer that, I, I want to thank you, Sally, so much for doing this. Uh, you've been an extraordinary colleague, and I'm so grateful that you would share this evening with me. So let's give it up, first of all, for Sally Joy. Thank you. And I also want to thank Town Hall and the Northwest African American Museum and Elliott Bay Books for hosting me. And it's great to be back in the Pacific Northwest, where my husband's from. He's originally from Victoria, British Columbia, uh, and where my dad escaped to, uh, Camas, Washington, when he finally couldn't stand Washington, D.C. anymore. So I feel a special tie to this part of the country. My parents were very, very different. My mother was the daughter of immigrants from Jamaica that came to Portland, Maine, of all places, in 1912. My grandfather was a janitor, my grandmother was a maid, uh, they had no formal education, and yet they came to this country for the reason many immigrants came, to, to seek a better life, and sent all five of their kids to college. Um, my mom, the youngest, uh, was unable to go where her brothers went. They all went to Bowdoin College in Maine because she was a girl. Her brothers went on to great success, doctors, university president, ophthalmologist. My mom almost didn't get to go to college because her father, who had saved up some money for his final child to, to go to college, had a catastrophic accident at the beginning of her junior year in high school. He was a janitor in a music store and he fell down the elevator shaft and shattered his back and his legs. And so he was in the hospital for months and months and months and all their savings were lost. And when it came time for my mom to go to college, she'd gotten into Radcliffe College, now part of Harvard, and uh, she was denied a scholarship for, for Radcliffe students from Maine because she was black. They said, you know, this scholarship is for people who will move in the proper circles when they come out of college and raise money for Radcliffe, and you can't do that because you're black. And her principal and her debate coach said, garbage, and they got Radcliffe to give her money directly and got her money from another source. And so this inspired her commitment to uh, increasing access to higher education for low-income people of all backgrounds, and hence her devotion to the Pell Grant program. My dad was born in segregated South Carolina in 1920, in the heart of Jim Crow and the height of lynching, and he was really shaped and, and, and stained by uh, the worst excesses of segregation. and went to Tuskegee, drafted in World War II, and was just mightily resentful that he was fighting or serving in, a, in an armed forces that was fighting for freedom for everybody but his own people. And he'd go off base trying to find some place to eat and he couldn't eat in restaurants but he saw German POWs getting served. And so his whole experience uh, was one of overcoming the uh, psychological and practical stigma uh, of segregation, and yet he rose to become a governor of the Federal Reserve, among other things. Um, and so these two sides of my family, different as they were, shared a commitment to education, 
shared a commitment to service, uh, and basically demanded of themselves and of me and my brother that we do our very best. You know, we could screw up, but we couldn't slack. By meaning, if we screwed up, by meaning we did, a, we tried our best, but we failed. That was okay. But if you didn't try your best, if you were skating, we got a lot of tough love. And tough love is just loving fiercely, but not uncritically. And that's what my parents instilled in me and my brother and, and just tried to make us hungry. Did your parents ever let you fail? Yes. And, and in fact, uh, my parents in some ways were the, the source, the proximate source of my greatest early failure. So I've just described these wonderful parents and they were absolutely wonderful, but as I write in the book, they had no business being married to each other. <laughs> and <laughs> by the time I was six or seven, my house was a tinderbox. Uh, it was kind of like living on a Civil War battlefield. They were screaming and yelling and throwing stuff and it was just really terrifying uh, for me and my little brother. And I was sort of the, the junior firefighter um, for lack of any alternative. You know, if I were in bed and they were having a really scary sounding fight, I'd sneak downstairs and spy on them and see how serious it was and if I thought I had to intervene, I would. I'd try to break it up physically if necessary, but more often try to mediate. And that's, uh, I learned too much, frankly, about what was at the root of their breakup. And, um, but that, I suffered as a result of that. I, you know, suffered in my friendships. It took me a while to get my bearing uh, academically. And so their failed marriage and their long custody battle, which I write about with um, a lot of you know, pain and honesty, uh, was really my first major challenge in life. And from that, I learned that I could take a blow and keep going. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had no choice, at least in my mind, but to keep going. And then I learned some mediating and negotiating skills that I didn't know might come in handy <laughs> a little bit later. It was like the Russians, you know? A, except there was no Americans, there were no good guys. They're not, obviously, they're both bad guys. I can see where that'd be hand, come in handy. You know, one of the things that this current president has brought out is kind of the dark underbelly of racism and bigotry that I, you know, I thought we'd made more progress than clearly we've made. Your, your father, I think, said something to the effect of never use race as an excuse or an advantage. Mm -hmm. um, but I personally am a believer in affirmative action because the playing field is not equal, as you pointed out, particularly with your parents. And uh, this state uh, has faced uh, action to remove affirmative action and currently faces action to reinstate it. Just curious if you have any thoughts for us on how we truly uh, move beyond the situation we're in now and begin to really address racism and bigotry to get past it. Well, let me begin with my parents and then come to the sure. present. When my parents said don't use race as an excuse or a crutch uh, or an advantage, they weren't suggesting that it wasn't very, very real. They'd lived the realist manifestations of it. Right. But what they were saying, and, and both my parents were believers in affirmative action, my mother actually a big champion of it. But um, what they were saying to me and my brother was because we were already fortunate, we had you know, had the best educational opportunities. We had the support of parents who had risen from where their parents came from and were giving us a leg up. What they were saying is, you know, for you, for me and my brother, don't try to get over by using race. You gotta do your best and we expect uh, that of you. And at the same time they taught us 
to be very conscious of who we are and where we came from and that we are part of a community, an African-American community that has a history and a proud legacy, but also has an ongoing fight to wage. And that's what they launched us with in terms of our, you know, our commitment to serving and doing. So bringing us forward to the present. It's, uh, it's, the first thing we have to do is, I think, root out the cancer that is spreading in our body politic that's being stoked by um, leaders who thrive on dividing us and diminishing all kinds of groups, African Americans, Latinos, immigrants, Muslims, otherizing everybody. And we've got to just excise that cancer. And then we got to look into ourselves and figure out, you know, we're going to be a majority minority country in 2044 by 2044 roughly how do we come together how do we make this a place where all of us whether we've been here forever or we just got here feel like we belong and to me that's about the law it's about how we enforce the law but it's also about ensuring that every one of us has a vote that counts and that we exercise that vote. Yes. And it's also about putting in place programs and policies that try not to leave people behind, whether it's in healthcare, whether it's education, uh, whether it's housing. And you know, we're doing just the opposite of that now. We're, we're imposing policies that are designed to keep people down. That's what we're seeing yes. now. Yeah. Change would be Change really, is going to really come. helpful. <laughs> I want to put in a plug for the Northwest African American Museum because that is a gathering place where these conversations happen. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. All right, we're going to lighten it up a little here, right. since that was a heavy question. We to go yeah, heavy on with, it. Yeah. And, and an important one. Um, you are an athlete. You always have been. You take care of the machine, which is your body, and uh, and so do I. And that's advice I give to a lot of people. Um, what b role has sports played in your life? And you know, I we're, I'm older uh, and a lot grayer. Um, but Title IX had not passed, and so in Renton High School, class in 1973, when we played half-court basketball, we had to shoot the basketball from between our knees because we weren't allowed to do an overhand shot because women weren't strong enough. <laughs> right? So, little tell different. That, tell that to my Washington Mystics, would you please? You're Washington, yeah. They're pretty hot. Yeah, we'll give it up for the Mystics. You know, we. We like our storm, but yeah, they didn't do as well. Just gotta, you know, it's just show okay. a little respect to the other Washington. The first. Seattle rain and, uh, you know, Megan Rapino doing okay, though, <laughs> on the soccer field. <laughs> so talk about sports. How has that uh, influenced your life? Well, it's been huge. I came out of the womb, you know, what we used to call a tomboy. Uh, a, a, well, we got that in common, too. <laughs> And I was very athletic, and I, you know, my favorite thing in second grade was to play football with the guys in my class. Um, and, you know, take a hit and deliver one. And, but I was small, you know, but I was fast. Then I, you know, my dad taught me how to play tennis, which was his passion. And it's still my favorite sport to this day, so I played tennis through high school. Uh, and, and, you know, found great joy in that. But I also played basketball, and not, not as well, by the way, as I played tennis. I was, there's, there are lots of falsehoods about me in the public domain. Most of them are negative. There's a myth out there that I'm a really good basketball player. <laughs> and it pains me to debunk it. But <laughs> since in tough love, I'm trying to be honest, I'll, I'll, I'll put it out there. But anyway, I played basketball, and it was that team sport experience, that, you know, 
very physical, very competitive experience. Fortunately, with coaches by the time I was in high school that were taking it very seriously. We were definitely shooting overhead. <laughs> uh, really taught me grit. It taught me, you know, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, as some of you will recall. Uh, but it made me much tougher. And it made me value the work of a team as opposed to, you know, the work of an individual. And so when, fast forward many years later, I was national security advisor. As I write in the book, my Secret Service call name was Point Guard, the position I played in high school. And it wasn't just because I liked playing Point Guard, but it's because that's how I viewed the role of national security advisor. You're running a team. You're calling the plays, but you're passing to somebody else. Uh, and that's, you know, that's how much sports have infused my whole psyche. So. I like that way better. You know, my, my Secret Service handle was Flying Fish. <laughs> <laughs> and I did not choose it. You did not choose it? I did not choose it. I guess it's better than Flying Squirrel, maybe. I don't know, but... That's good. I'm you should have you should have asked for a revision. Sometimes I, I should have. Sometimes you can get it. Okay. Well, good to know. If I'm ever back there. But um, my my predecessor had been Iron Hand. Iron Hand. A man. As oh, you really? Might I'm shocked. Okay. And that just struck me as a little too harsh. So we we went with point guard. So it shades of Goldfinger or something. But I'm a huge. Let me just say one more. <laughs> Women, girls playing sports. I, ca I cannot underscore how valuable I think that is. And I'm proud that my daughter is also an athlete, much better than I ever was. But I just think it just, it's a huge growth experience. I'll put in a plug for climbing mountains, too. She does that. I don't. <laughs> that was my sport. Not me. All right. Before we get off the personal stuff, um, oh, by the way, she was, she did play collegiate basketball, but it was for... Oxford University. Right. Yeah. When she was a Rhodes Scholar, you know, that hotbed of basketball fame. Yeah. That was about as far as I could go at the collegiate level. So you, you already knew Ian at that point. Uh, you guys um, met at Stanford, right? Tell us a little bit about how you first met. That's, a, that's in the book. <laughs> so my wonderful Canadian husband, uh, was one of the first people I met in my freshman year. I lived in a dorm at Stanford, which was freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. And the senior classes threw an ice cream social for the freshmen, you know, the first few days of school. And across the room, I see this really tall, very handsome guy with curly brown hair and really sweet face. And so we start talking. And uh, mind you, I'm from Washington, D.C. East Coast, never lived outside of the East Coast. I think I'm really well educated. I go to this fancy high school. I get to Stanford and this guy says, so where are you from? And I said, I'm from Washington, D.C. Because I realized already when you're on the West Coast, you got to call your Washingtons. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said to him, so where are you from? And he said, British Columbia. And I'm going, British Columbia. Where's British Columbia? <laughs> so I start this deductive process. There's British Guiana, <laughs> and there's French Guiana, <laughs> and there's Colombia. <laughs> so I said, is that in South America? <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> and he looks at me like I'm the biggest idiot he's ever met. <laughs> but I swear to God, as I've moved up in the, in the diplomatic circles, he's gotten more mileage out of that story. <laughs> at my expense. Well deserved. I can't believe I'm telling this story on myself in the Pacific Northwest. It's bad enough on the East Coast. It's, it's better than faking, <laughs> faking it. Yeah, so... Um, there was a post that you got, I think it was 
was it in the Clinton administration where it was basically based on your performance on a geography test. So I'm trying to reconcile this with British Columbia. <laughs> you want to tell us a bit about that? Okay, so first of all, this is some years later, a good 14 years later. I'm, uh, no, maybe 12. I'm in my first job on the National Security Council staff. I had my first job at 28, um, and I was responsible for the United Nations and peacekeeping stuff, uh, junior entry-level policy staffer. And I'm riding in the car with the National Security Advisor named Tony Lake, and we'd just come back from Capitol Hill. We were meeting with some senators trying to persuade them that we should pay our dues to the United Nations. <laughs> Perennial challenge. <laughs> and so he's in a good mood because he thinks we've done well with the senators, so he starts bantering. And he says, so what's the capital of Botswana? And I say, mispronouncing it, Gaborone. He said, close, it's Haberone, but okay. And what's the capital of Tanzania? And I say, Dar es Salaam. And he goes, and what's the capital of Burkina Faso? And I say, Ouagadougou. <laughs> and he's like, you want to be senior director for African affairs? <laughs> it's a good thing he didn't ask you about British Columbia. But he didn't ask me. He didn't ask me about that, thank God. Uh, and but. That's a true story, but obviously that wasn't the basis on which he was making the job offer, but that's how he rolled out the offer. And I shudder to think if I had missed Ouagadougou. <laughs> but in any event, uh, you know, I'd studied Africa for my PhD and you know, I'd worked on a lot of African issues at, at the, doing the UN job, which was about 60, 70% African uh, policy issues. But that's how I got offered my first promotion in government. I love that story. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to wrap up with, on the sort of the personal family front before we dive into the career and all the icky hard stuff. Um, although there's some hard stuff, certainly about being a working mother with a husband with a pretty intense job too, and uh, you know being in government where there's you know few opportunities to take a day off, uh, truly take a day off. Talk a little bit about your journey as a mother and a wife and, and uh, you know, maybe some of the tough love you might have given yourself along that journey. Well, when I was in the Clinton administration, I had three jobs. This first one for UN Affairs, the second one still at the National Security Council, r running the very small Africa office. And then my third one was as Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. So I moved in the second term of the administration from the White House to the State Department. And all of a sudden, at age 32, having just had my first baby three months earlier, I went to the State Department to run the Africa Bureau and all of our embassies in Sub-Saharan Africa as a breastfeeding mom. And uh, suffice it to say that the culture at the State Department at that time was not altogether conducive to an assistant secretary who was a breastfeeding mom whose son learned to walk in the halls of the State Department. But thankfully, the Secretary of State was Madeleine Albright the first female Secretary of State and somebody who I'd been blessed to know for many years. And so she made it all okay and helped to, to change the culture there real time because it might bring my son in to breastfeed and I'd be pumping when I couldn't breastfeed and you know, everybody's just sort of had to, to deal with it. And then we were able to make it possible for mothers who were not so senior to have the accommodations that they needed uh, to do what they needed to do. But all through it and into my later years, the, the thing that was so valuable to me was I had this extraordinary husband, the Canadian, uh, <laughs> who was more than an equal partner at many points along the way. And 
in particular when I was in the Obama administration and we now had two kids and he was, uh, his career has been as a journalist and he was the executive producer of ABC's Sunday show this week. Um, I was in New York as UN ambassador coming home if I could on the weekends. He was, his week got intense because it's a Sunday show, sort of Thursday through Sunday. And meanwhile, he's home managing the kids and supporting my parents who were, whose health was rapidly declining. And, you know, I can't say enough how extraordinary he is and how grateful I am to him. But at some point in this process, in early 2011, as I'm up at the UN and he's at home, he decided that he would step down from uh, ABC and step down from journalism and focus um, much more fully on the family so that I could continue to do my job in New York. Um, and he went into the nonprofit world and he's been you know, very happily doing that since. But he do has not since then had you know, a full-time intense uh, job. And I also had, you know, my parents, before they became too ill, were very, very supportive and involved with our kids. And so, you know, it, 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 you've heard the term coined by Secretary Clinton that it takes a village to raise a child. In my experience, it took at least that uh, and more. So yeah, I don't think any of us have this balance or so to speak, I think that's a misnomer. Um, and none of us are an island. Even if we're single parents, we still are relying on somebody or some structure to help support us. And um, the other thing I'd say is, you know, it, 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 it's not everything all at once. You're not always, you know, it's not always all work or all family. You, you know, you have phases of your life where you're, you know, you're going faster and slower, at least I have, and you know, for this period in my life, we still got our eldest child, eldest in college, youngest still at home, and since leaving government, I've had you know, much, much more time to be present for our daughter than I'd had in the years prior. And isn't that nice? Oof, yeah. Well, you, uh, you, know, you have dealt with some incredible, incredibly tough negotiations and people during your career. It sounds like, you know, with your son kind of a well-known conservative on the Stanford campus and your daughter being pretty left-leaning, maybe they're just, maybe it's just their way of bringing you some tough love to keep you in the game. <laughs> How's that going? I don't know if it's tough love for me and my husband or, you know, we, we my husband and I really taught our kids to think for themselves and to have their own views and to have the courage of their convictions. And unfortunately, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so. Be careful what you wish for. You know, your, yeah, okay. So our dinner table can get a little funky. <laughs> but, and, and sometimes more than funky actually, but we are actually of quite a close family. And, you know, I love those kids as much as any parent can love their children. And I've actually learned a lot from having these different perspectives. And they've learned a lot from each other, and they keep us on our toes. <laughs> so if you want to call that tough love, I'll accept that. <laughs> okay. All right, moving on to um, career. You've been, a, you know, in so many incredibly uh, important roles, and I'm sure you were the only or the youngest many uh, attributes where you would be standing out in a room. You would talk to us a little bit about, you know, what it was like kind of early on in government where, I mean, I walked into the Obama administration to a rich diversity and a wonderful tapestry of people, but that is not what was present in the Clinton administration or really any administration before that time. So can you talk to us a little bit about your early days in the Clinton administration, what that was like, and any stories you want to share about that? Yeah, well, it, I was, to a great extent, usually the youngest in the room, and often the only woman, and almost certainly the only African-American woman. 
And, you know, as, uh, as much as I was conscious of that, um, particularly when I went to the State Department and, you know, I was such an outlier by virtue of my age, my race, my gender. Um, but I have to say that by the time I felt sort of, you know, an island in the State Department, you know, where I was blessed to have the Secretary of State backing me up, I'd been at the White House for four and a half years. And even though there too I was almost always an only, I was really fortunate to have mentors who took an, a, an early interest in me. And they were all white men. Richard Clark, a former counterterrorism czar, Tony Lake, former national security advisor, Sandy Berger, national security advisor. And they believed in me. They gave me more and more responsibility. They, you know, they taught me an enormous amount along the way. So I never felt in that context, even early, even as I was an only, that I was alone. And uh, I can't, you know, I can't explain that other than, you know, good fortune and good people. Um, but, you know, by the time I then got to the State Department, it was a little less friendly and a little less uh, supportive um, at the ranks I was dealing with. And there I had to learn some lessons the hard way. Um, and there were people who tried to intimidate me. Richard Holbrook. Right. Uh, <laughs> didn't work. The power of the pen, it's in the book. Power of the pen. Um, I learned some nonverbal communication skills that I speak about how I deployed in the book. I don't know if there are young people in the audience, I learned this the hard way, so I won't use the gesture that um, <laughs> I had to employ under duress. Um, but this was a place where, you know, I had to really take to heart what my father taught me from early in my childhood, which is don't take crap off of anyone. That was his mantra, coming out of, you know, segregation and Jim Crow and, you know, job discrimination, don't take crap off of anyone. Don't let anybody diss you or define you for you. So when you know, I was a young, breastfeeding, 32-year-old assistant secretary, and a few elbows got thrown at me. I threw some back. Uh, and, you know, I also made some mistakes and learned along the way. Uh, and you can talk about that if you want, but I learned in that context that my hard-charging, impatient, take-no-prisoners leadership style was not going to fly too well over there. And so I had to correct course, and I was lucky to have another um, very generous person who became a mentor take me out to lunch and sit me down over crappy Chinese food and tell me that I was going to fail if I didn't change course. And he told me where I was failing and what I could do. And this man was uh, named Howard Wolpe. He was a former congressman from Michigan but he was working in the State Department. And he was a political appointee, so he you know, came from a different side of things. And he just spoke to me in a fashion that I recognized from my childhood, when my dad used to say to me, you may not like what I'm gonna tell you, but understand it comes from somebody with your best interest at heart. And that's the, you know, probably the greatest example of professional tough love I've received uh, and one of the most valuable uh, interventions I've been fortunate to sustain. That's good. There's a lot of people I can think of in my background that were, in some cases, just real idiots in some other ways, but they delivered some good tough love that made me a lot better. You also learn sometimes about how not to be, so you've talked about Richard Holbrook. Talk a little bit about you know, what that was like. It's kind of a bully, right? Not kind of. Okay. <laughs> not kind of. <laughs> we, 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 you know, he's passed, so we're not going to go too far in speaking ill. But, yeah, he was a very talented diplomat. Hmm. But not someone who um, 
took well to somebody like me. So our first meeting, let me just tell this one, because so, I can't really tell the, the bird story without being able to see if there's anybody young in here. Um, my first experience with Richard Holbrook was when I was assistant secretary. He had just, he had been named UN ambassador but not yet confirmed, so he had all this time on his hands. And I'm up on Capitol Hill and my assistant calls and she says, Ambassador Holbrook's in your office and he wants you to come back and meet him right away. I said, what's he talking about? I'm on Capitol Hill meeting with members of Congress. I can't blow off those meetings. And she said, I understand and I have explained that to him, but he's not leaving. <laughs> I said, well, all right, just make sure he doesn't steal anything. <laughs> and I'll be there when I get there. <laughs> so about an hour and a half later, I get back to my office and there's a man sitting on my couch. I'd literally never met him before. I walk up to him in my office and I say, what's so urgent that you know we couldn't schedule an appointment? And he looks at me and he says, you know, I dislike you already <laughs> because you broke my record as the youngest regional assistant secretary of state. Ooh. And it's like, what kind of asshole is this? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> and our relationship went downhill from there. <laughs> that was a high point, huh? <laughs> Wow. So it must have been um, really interesting uh, to be on Team Clinton so deeply um, when during the election, when Hillary Clinton was running in the primary against Barack Obama for you to make a decision to jump off the Clinton ship when you respected both Bill and Hillary Clinton tremendously to join this uh, young upstart from Illinois. Do you want to talk to us a little bit about what must have gone through your mind and how you came to that decision? Well, my first experience with Obama came in 2004 when he was running for the Senate as an Illinois state senator. And I was actually working on the John Kerry for president campaign as one of his uh, foreign policy advisors. And the man I've mentioned, a former uh, national security advisor, Tony Lake, had been asked by Obama if he would give Obama some foreign policy advice as he was running for the Senate. So Lake said, sure. But Lake said, you know, you really should be in touch with Susan Rice on the Kerry campaign because you, know, you want to have the ability to judge whether you want to be aligned with the nominee's policies or you want to make, you know, departure from the nominee's policies. But she can give you a sense of, you know, what's, what Kerry's thinking. So Obama and I started talking on the phone of two or three times over that summer. I'd never met him. I'd only seen his extraordinary Boston Convention speech when he was a keynote that year. And I write in the book, the very beginning, how seeing that speech, and I only was able to watch it on TV, I couldn't be in the hall that night. And I was just drawn to the television and I literally started crying mm -hmm. as I was watching this speech because there was a politician of my generation who was African American, who was clearly brilliant, who shared my temperament, my instincts, my values, and who to me represented the future. Uh, he wasn't you know, coming out of the Vietnam era, he wasn't coming out of the civil rights movement, all of which you know, I honor and hail, but he was to me forward looking which was very important, particularly in the middle of the Kerry campaign when it was all about swift boats and right. you know, Vietnam. And when he came to Washington, once he was elected, I got to know him better, both socially and uh, professionally. 
and advised him as he joined the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and wrote his book on policy, et cetera. So when he decided to run for president, I knew I was gonna be all in on that. And he asked me and Tony Lake to coordinate his national security team and build us a bench of advisors for him. And about three or four weeks after I'd committed to Obama, I get a phone call from my other former boss and former national security advisor, Sandy Berger, who was working for Clinton. They'd been closed for many years, helping her establish her foreign policy team. And he offered me essentially the same job for Clinton that I just accepted for Obama. Mm. And I said, you know, Sandy, I'm really sorry and I'm really moved you wouldn't offer this, but I've just signed up with Obama. And he said, you know this is, you know he can't win, right? <laughs> and at that point, and nobody in their right mind really thought he would win, mm -hmm. truthfully. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, Sandy, I realize that's quite possible. And he said, you know, this is probably a career ending move. And he wasn't threatening me, he was describing to me reality as a friend. And I said, Sandy, you know, I'm not making a decision against the Clintons, I've made a decision for Obama. And you know, the, the conversation ended amicably and, you know, Sandy and I stayed good friends, but he basically warned me, which, you know, had, <laughs> had Clinton won, he would have been 100% <laughs> right. Uh, but this was at a level that was so much deeper to me than personal ambition or what my next job would be. It was about who I was and who I thought we had the potential to be as America. That's a lovely, <laughs> lovely story. So you worked in, deeply in the Clinton White House, and you worked deeply in, in two cabinet-level roles in the Obama White House, first as UN ambassador, and uh, next as national security advisor. And I walked in to your uh, second term with President Obama, at which point the women of the White House and the cabinet were getting together regularly. And we it had was, an underground network. It was amazing. <laughs> like I went to my first meeting, which was uh, you know dinner usually, uh, and mostly just kind of kind of girlfriends. And it gave me a window into Kathleen Sebelius, Health, uh, Health and Human Services Secretary at the time, to say, Kathleen. This White House correspondence dinner is coming up. Like, what do you wear? Like, how much skin? Uh, you know, <laughs> how many dresses do I need? Right. So it was a different White House. Um, can you talk to us about just kind of the contrasts and what it was uh, like under the Clinton White House and how different it might have been in a much more diverse uh, White House with President Obama? Well, the the Clinton White House was not devoid of women by any stretch right. or his cabinet, but we had a lot more. And in the Obama administration, um, you know, large portion of the cabinet, much of the senior staff. By the time my tenure as national security advisor was into its uh, second year, all three of the president's senior most national security uh, people were women myself, my uh, principal deputy, and the uh, counterterrorism and homeland security czar, plus the chief of staff uh, of the National Security Council. So it, you know, it was, women were not playing in that White House. And it was great because we all had each other's backs. And it wasn't like we had to have each other's backs against you know, an enemy or a force that was in opposition to us. But it was that there was enough of us between the cabinet and the senior staff of the White House that we had a sisterhood and we backed each other up and we, you know, supported each other through thick and thin. So, you know, the Health and Human Services has got nothing to do with the United Nations. 
But, you know, one of my biggest supporters and, you know, advisors and boosters when I was going through, you know, the worst of the Benghazi stuff was Kathleen Sebelius. Mm -hmm. And we had that kind of support network. So, and we had fun. I mean, we just basically went out to dinner, started drinking and laughing. <laughs> and, and none of us had to drive because we all had people driving That's us, right? right? It was great. <laughs> So you, uh, um, in your memoir, you, you talked about one of the most gratifying initiatives uh, during the administration was leading the uh, National Security Council principles push to diversify the national security workforce. So I'm curious uh, why you think it is so important and, and how we would benefit uh, tremendously from having more diversity in that workforce, which is, I am assuming, not very diverse at all. Well, it, it it sure as hell isn't now. <laughs> Even back in the Obama administration, in 2011, President Obama uh, instituted an executive order designed to increase diversity in, this, in the federal workforce more broadly. Um, increase recruitment, retention, measuring results, um, and we're talking about not just racial diversity, but sexual orientation, uh, religious, blah, blah, blah. And yet the national security workforce as a subset of the broader federal workforce was way behind. Not that the broader workforce was sufficient, but you know, in national security, <clears throat> when you looked at our ambassadors and you looked at our senior military officers and senior intelligence leaders, it was particularly problematic. And I, believe strongly, and all the data backs it up, whether you're in the private sector leading a corporation and establishing a board or a C-suite team, or whether you're in the, you know, the nonprofit world or in government, that when you have people who come from different perspectives, different backgrounds, uh, the quality of the decision making is vastly improved. And, you know, you can, find any number of high quality studies that back that up. Mm -hmm. And I felt particularly when it comes to national security, here we are literally the most diverse nation on the face of the earth. Every language, every nationality, every um, ethnic group represented within our shores. And yet the people making national security decisions were still, you know, male and Yale for the most part, like, or the equivalent, right? And that didn't serve us well. It was almost as if we were engaging the world and trying to, you know, cr make decisions and influence opinion with one hand tied behind our back, not utilizing the, th this extraordinary national asset we have, which was our diversity. And not surprisingly, President Obama was supportive and but somewhat surprisingly to me, all of my cabinet colleagues were totally supportive. So whether it was Kerry at the State Department or Ash Carter at Defense or Brennan and Clapper for the intelligence community uh, or the FBI and the Justice Department, they were competing with each other for who could be most ahead of the curve in terms of what they could do with respect to recruitment, retention, promotion and measuring results. And as national security advisor, I chaired countless meetings in the situation room around the principals committee table, this cabinet level gathering. And some of those meetings got hot. Some of them were really stressful. Nothing was more enjoyable than the work we did together on increasing diversity in the national security workforce. That's great. It was pushing on an open door, and it was so much fun. Do you have any uh, examples what, around the world of where those perspectives that um, were built around the table were particularly helpful in making decisions on behalf of our government that probably would have been very different if there had not been diversity in the room? Yeah, I'll give you one that, was, uh, that I write about in the book and that uh, 
really taxed all of us. Many of you will remember 2014, the Ebola epidemic. And we were sitting at the principal's committee table and the um, head of the Centers for Disease Control tabled a chart, put a, circulated a chart that was in effect a hockey stick. It showed what would happen with respect to infections in West Africa if we didn't get a grip on the problem. And basically, this is early September, and by the end of December, the chart was predicting 1.4 million infections without some intervention to bend that curve. And we were wrestling with what do we do? Um, we'd ramped up our civilian response, we'd had aid workers in there, we were trying to bring in other countries, and nothing was moving the needle fast enough. And around that table, we had people, many of whom had worked in Africa in the past, including Gail Smith, the, uh, who was uh, senior director for African Affairs, Martin Dempsey, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, who earlier in his career had worked on various African issues, um, and we recommended to the president that he, for the first time, any president, deploy the American military to deal with a health emergency. And we weren't deploying the military to treat patients. We were using the military to help construct healthcare infrastructure so there were treatment centers and that healthcare workers could have the confidence that if they went into the hot zone, to treat people, that they'd have a way to be safely evacuated and get medical care. So we organized that entire global response, not just the military piece, but the diplomatic piece and the development piece. And when we had a really scary period, as you recall, when we started having a few Ebola cases on US soil, mm -hmm. including in Texas um, and elsewhere, there was huge pressure in Congress uh, and in the media to shut the borders and prevent anybody coming and going from West Africa. And because there were people like me and others who understood, one, what's necessary to contain an epidemic, and two, the economic and social costs of preventing Americans and people from West Africa from going back and forth. We were able to beat back that pressure and resist understanding that, you know, and I think in a way, frankly, that people who did not know Africa and did not know how closely intertwined the West African community is with parts of the United States, mm -hmm. that we would be cutting off our nose to spite our face. And President Obama got that and we were able to fight and resist that pressure such that we devised a smart way of screening people but not closing our borders. I don't know that that would happen today. What do you think? It is happening today and we are not <laughs> responding in the same way. Exactly. Yeah. So you are also, I mean, that's a, a really interesting um, illustration of the work of the National Security Council that I think people would not have anticipated. You would have thought it was Health and Human Services, but it's very much a national security issue. Um, just, uh, you know, the last week or two, we've been having all these announcements about Nobel Prize winners, and, and the Nobel Peace Prize went to the uh, current Ethiopian Prime Minister, Abiy Ahmed, and that's because of uh, his decisive commitment to basically accept um, arbitration on what the border should be with Eritrea. Finally. Finally. So you worked in that region yourself. Uh, you have seen all manner of world leaders. Do you want to give us a, a little bit of a sense of, you know, what you've learned about the importance of leadership and, you know, any examples you want to share on maybe some surprisingly good leaders you've worked with or some <laughs> unmitigated disasters that we can learn from? Well, starting with uh, Prime Minister Abiy of Ethiopia, I mean, he has only been in office not even two years and came in relatively unknown and took a very bold decision 
to reach out to Eritrea, where they'd been a cold peace for almost 20 years. Um, following, following the, uh, the peace agreement that we had negotiated under the Clinton administration, it stopped the war, but it didn't bring peace. And uh, he reached out, and, and Isaiah responded, and you know that frozen conflict is moving slowly in the direction of resolution. So that was encouraging, and he deserves enormous credit. But to your point, Sally, it shows you what bold leadership and visionary and principled leadership can accomplish. And you know, I've seen so many instances of leaders driving their countries off a cliff, like Robert Mugabe uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, or Yes. <laughs> Did y'all hear that? <laughs> you know, and so just not to draw the obvious stark contrast, but look at what a difference three years can make in terms of temperament and, you know, care and intellect and, <laughs> you know. Keep going. So, <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just here in the United States. It's not just in Africa. We see you know, the difference leadership can make, positive and negative. You know, I, look what's happening in Turkey, or with Turkey. I write about in the book um, about one of my most favorite world leaders, um, the former Israeli President Shimon Peres, who I came to know on a very uh, personal level, who was a wonderful human being, but he was a man who had brought his country into being and was committed to a two-state solution and rights and a state for the Palestinians and gave his entire professional life to that end, didn't live to see it realized, and now in the same country, we just as we have had swings here, we have leadership that evinces no interest in a two-state solution. And so um, we've got to lift up and applaud those leaders that do bold things for the right reasons, like Prime Minister Abe. Um, and we need to call out, whether in our own shores or abroad, those who are trying to divide and destroy. It's a lot easier to win a war than to win a peace. So, yeah. So, who knew you could squander success in a week? No kidding. It's amazing. So we've got a few questions here from the audience and I'd encourage you, if you have one, to write it on one of the cards that I think were provided and pass it into the aisles and someone will come by to collect those. and. Uh, so I'll start with a few of these. Um, this is really about uh, Syria. What are the long-term consequences of Russia winning the Syrian influence contest? Well, Russia didn't even win the Syrian influence contest. We just walked off the field. Um, so it's even worse in a way than, than winning. Um, so let me break down the consequences broadly in, as to what's just happened in Syria. First of all, the United States said to the Kurds with whom we have been working, they have fought ISIS for the United States and the Western world, losing 11,000 of their men and women fighters and we just said to them, because the president had a phone call or woke up on the wrong side of the bed, that we're done, bye. And we're pulling out and we're leaving you to the wolves in the form of the Turks. So not only did we sell out the Kurds, and we've now embroiled northern Syria in a horrible humanitarian uh, catastrophe, but we've said to any country or partner around the world who's trusted in our word 
any ally who relies on us for you know, mutual security, that, that we're completely untrustworthy. So think about the ramifications of that. Think about if you're, you know, Hamid Karzai, excuse me, if you're... <laughs> not your favorite. Not Hamid Karzai, Ashraf Ghani, the president of uh, Afghanistan, Karzai was the bad leader before him. Uh, and the United States is essentially negotiating already behind your back with the Taliban. What are you going to think now about our willingness to stand by the Afghan government, even after 18 years of being in that country? Or if you're Japan or South Korea or Poland, what are you going to think? Or Israel? So we've basically scared legitimately our partners around the world. Secondly, we have taken our um, foot off of the gas of trying to contain ISIS. And already in a week, there have been ISIS attacks resumed. There have been prisoners that have escaped uh, or broken out of uh, detention. You know, we have literally opened Pandora's box and we're now seeing the consequences. And if, if Americans think that we will not feel the effects of this counterterrorism capitulation, um, I think we're gonna be sorely surprised. And then, of course, to the question, Russia, Iran, Assad are the biggest beneficiaries. We've handed the Kurds and their loyalty over to that side. And Turkey, of course, is the other major beneficiary, along with ISIS. So how's that for a week's work? Really, almost a day's work, I mean. Can we recover? You're asking in the macro sense, not yes. in Syria? or I'm asking in a macro sense. Can we recover from what has happened uh, collectively in terms of our foreign policy? Can, um, Since yeah. you were... Yeah. in your position? I think the answer is yes, provided that we're talking about in 18 months rather than five and a half years. We can't take five and a half years of this. Um, and we can't underestimate how much confidence has already been lost. It's not as if we elect a new president uh, and even, if God willing, a new Senate and expect everything to be okay with the rest of the world because we have walked away from agreements that we've signed. We've demonstrated our fickleness. We've undermined our alliances. We've bolstered our adversaries. We've abandoned our support for human rights and democracy. We've turned every relationship into a transaction, including for the personal, political, and financial gain of one man. It's not America first, y'all. It's me first. And for the United States to recover from that, we're going to have to show the world that this was an aberration. And nobody rational would make that judgment after one term, two terms, even several terms of, you know, sort of a return to our more normal constancy. Because how are we ever going to convince somebody that we can't do this again? So this is going to require long-term, very serious, very sustained effort and investment on the part of the American people and our leadership. And the thing that's most troubling in some ways, I suspect, to our foreign partners is not that we have a president who is manifestly unreliable, to put it politely, but it's that our institutions haven't sufficiently checked him, particularly <laughs> Congress. I think people expected our 
system to have more guardrails than it turns out that it has. So much of what we expect out of Washington is based on norms, more than laws that are enforceable. And Congress, when they decide to go into a coma, you know, it makes a big difference. Well, I know getting really good, experienced people back in government would be very helpful. Right, Sally. Just saying. Yeah. Yeah. Good. You go for it, girl. <laughs> <laughs> All right, another question from the audience. Which voices in foreign policy do you read to challenge your own perspective and point of view? Um, I actually find um, some of the Bush era, Reagan era, Republican perspectives, um, particularly Reagan, Bush one, some Bush two, um, to be thoughtful and worthy it differs from my perspective in many ways, but until recently, foreign policy and national security was really played within the 40 yard lines. Depend, whatever side you were on, there were cer certain more or less bounds that we conformed to. We believed in our allies. You know, we upheld our commitments. Uh, you know, we tried to stand up in the face of aggression. All of that's come a cropper. And so, you know, those people whose views I may differ with, but, um, you know, fall within those traditional confines, you know, I find very worthy of, of consideration and very worthy of studying. And, you know, there's a little known secret out there, which is that there is, in fact, a bipartisan um, community of national security experts. And they know each other, uh, they go to conferences together, they rely on each other, and then on occasion, they try to push policy outcomes together. And that's frayed a little bit in the era of Trump because Trump has basically excommunicated those on the Republican side that were so-called never-Trumpers. Uh, but it exists, and there, it can be revived and resuscitated. And, you know, it's not the spooky trilateral commission. It's... Uh, it's thoughtful people who come from different perspectives but, but are all committed to the national interests. You know, I think that one of the most pleasant surprises I had from working in government is the incredible talent of our public servants and how much they dedicate themselves to their work all over the world for not only our benefit but really for the benefit of, of humankind. I mean, it's, uh, and it does break my heart to see them uh, leave because they just can't take it anymore. So I hope they're still out there and we can get them back if we uh, if we do see a change. Can, since you yeah, go ahead. Pitch that ball. <laughs> um, it's, it's your specialty. You know, I get asked a lot when I go to universities in particular, but just go around the country by young people who are trying to figure out what they should do. They want to. They're interested in service, they're interested in government, they're interested in foreign policy and development, but should they go into government still? And what I always say to them and to those who are inside who are wrestling with, should I stay or should I go? I try really hard to convince all of them to come and to stay. Because it, it's hugely important, rewarding, and noble work. But if we let this team over hopefully no more than four years drive out all the talent and all the commi committed people, we're gonna have a generational deficit. And we can't afford that. So You're here. we need people to hang in there. We do. And we need young people to sign up. And you know, it'll, by the time you get through usajobs.gov, it'll probably be the next election. <laughs> I just encourage you to hang in there. 
All right, another question here. Um, this is a topic you know a lot about. It's about Iran. I think there's lessons in here for the United States as well. Hardliners currently control popular dialogue in Iran related to the concept of the United States as an arch enemy. What can be done to support growth of moderates in Iran that would pave the way for better relations? We are so not in a position at the moment to support moderates in Iran. <laughs> you think? I mean, it's... Yeah. So, it would help if when we made a deal, we stuck to it. <laughs> Particularly when the other side was fully adhering to the deal. And verifiably so. And it was, in fact, relative moderates in Iran who went out on a limb to cut this deal with us and implement it. And now that we've sawed off that limb, we've given great life and sustenance to the hardliners who have now marginalized these people. And, you know, this is arguably one of the most irretrievable um, failures, in my opinion, of Trump administration policy. I don't know how we get back to where we were with Iran effectively prevented from acquiring a nuclear weapon with the most intrusive transparent inspection regime, uh, with the plutonium and uranium pathways cut off. Because why would anybody get back into a deal that they can't be confident we'd implement? Um, and what does that say to North Korea? to the extent that there's a hope for diplomacy there. Um, so I think, you know, if we can find our way through this thicket and not end up in a hot war with Iran or through proxies with Iran, uh, you know, there may be come again a time when um, through diplomacy, soft and hard through economic engagement, we can nurture the resurgence of, you know, moderates in political capacities in Iran. It's an incredibly talented population with you know, huge potential that, you know, as human beings should be natural allies, if not for a regime that is not. And so figuring out how to get past Washington and Tehran to a place where, as peoples, we can know each other better is, is a, a, a problem we're not gonna solve in the very short term, but it's one we gotta keep our eye on. It's a challenge we ought to try to rise to. So, we have tremendous political divisions within this country. You've got some political divisions within your own family. You talked about that. Uh, not to equate that to this, but it feels like a real national security threat to not have voices heard, to marginalize people to one side or the other, to not really have um, the capacity for people to have thoughtful dialogues together. You know, what, what can we do about that, do you think? Well, I write in the book, and I spend basically the last chapter on this. It's called Bridging the Divide. And I write about you know, my family, and I write about our nation and all that's in between. And I say very baldly that, in my judgment, the greatest national security vulnerability we have at the moment is, in fact, our domestic political division. And I say that for all the variety of reasons. One, we are losing our capacity to compete with countries that are rising like China because we can't even agree on simple stuff like investing in infrastructure. You know, <laughs> paid family leave, investments in research and development. How are we gonna compete in AI and biotechnology and all this stuff in where we're basically inert? Support for Pell Grants. Support for Pell right. Grants. Immigration. Immigration. I mean, we are just stuck because we're divided internally while everybody else is motoring along. 
That's one. Separate, secondly, our adversaries are preying on our domestic divisions and trying to exacerbate them and cause us to hate each other and divide irreparably from within. That's what the Russians are doing every day, not just during our election, but every day with their involvement in social media, their uh, interference in all aspects of our democratic process. And we make it easy for them because these divisions exist. They're just pouring salt in the wound. So I write that the most urgent thing we have to do is to recognize that this is critical, but it's also fixable. The good news is this is a problem of our own creation. So therefore, it's a problem that we have the capacity to address. And I also write that you know, in case people are so totally despairing in the moment, remember all that we've been through as a nation. You know, we've had much, much worse, more divisive times than now. Civil War, Reconstruction, two world wars, McCarthyism, Vietnam, when students were being shot on campus. The Civil Rights era, where our cities were burning at their cores. We've just had all these moments which have been much, much more painful and divisive. And yet, somehow, we've come through them. And we've come out the other side, arguably, stronger. So this is one of those moments of testing. And we have the capacity to do it from a very personal level where we have to listen to each other and understand each other and try to find those areas where we can agree and respect the areas where we disagree. That's at the very you know, human interpersonal level or at my dinner table, to use an analogy. But we also need to look at the structure of our system. How do we teach civics education? How do we teach kids to consume news when it comes from all kinds of sources and can be easily manipulated? How do we teach students to be comfortable with dissenting opinions on college campuses from the right or the left? How do we structure our politics so that they're not designed to reward the extremes, whether it's campaign finance or redistricting or you know, primary systems that reward either far side rather than you know, work through things like ranked choice voting. There are all kinds of systemic reforms that we could implement. And then I make the case, uh, I realize it's controversial and expensive, but I really think we're at the point where we need to consider mandatory national service. Um, for young people, say, 18 to 22, six, 12 months, regardless of your socioeconomic background, you will be living with and working with people who come from vastly different experiences and backgrounds. and as part of a project of national renewal. And maybe we can tie it to infrastructure. <laughs> so we'll Just leave saying. it on that positive note with a little tough love for all of us on what we can do about this. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a round of appreciation for Susan Rice. Thank Sally, thank you so much. Really appreciate you.